This session is on uh, settlement and integration, the Saskatchewan experience. And uh, in particular, we want to hear from uh, what I call uh, frontline workers here who are uh, faced with the, uh, uh, the challenges, um, challenges faced by uh, settlement agencies um, uh, and how realistic are settlement expectations uh, for immigrants and, and refugees. Um, is there any, are there any sorts of improvements that uh, can be identified? Uh, I know that would take about a week to uh, <laughs> talk about all that, but uh, how could assistance to government and private uh, refugee sponsors uh, be improved? But, but whatever, uh, there are lots of challenges and uh, we have a, a really uh, uh, excellent uh, um, collection of, of panelists here. Um, who I'll introduce in more detail uh, when um, each one begins. But uh, going along here in alphabetical order, uh, Ali Abukar, of course, is well known as the uh, ED of uh, uh, Saskatoon uh, uh, Open Door Society. Uh, Melanie Berg is uh, a vital part of uh, Global Gathering Place. Helen Smith McIntyre is omnipresent, uh, <laughs> lots of capacities, but uh, uh, the Saskatoon, she chairs the Saskatoon uh, Refugee Coalition and April Sora uh, is with the city. So um, we'll start with Ali. Ali is a um, former refugee himself from Somalia. Uh, and no, I'm not misreading the notes from the, the minister. Uh, <laughs> uh, but anyway, uh, he's now executive director of uh, Saskatoon Open Door Society, which of course is a very comprehensive um, immigrant and refugee uh, settlement agency. So, Ali. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, Thank you for inviting me today to, to this event and to speak with, to have this conversation. Um, it, it seems I, I can recognize many faces here and, and having this conversation and talking about the challenges of, of settlement organizations with you is, is uh, like bridging the, the choir. Um, so it also make, puts me in a, in a spot where it's a little bit more intimidating to, to share the same things that you know with, with all of you, but it is still um, a very important uh, topic to talk about, especially what we talked about earlier today about the importance of immigration to our communities and as well as um, the importance of settlement and integration. Um, talking about settlement, settlement is, is a process and uh, it takes long for uh, people to become successful and, and be part of the community. And all our, of our organizations in the settlement sector exist to, to help with that process. And um, I wanted to uh, speak um, about the questions that are listed here, but also before I do that, I wanted to start with a with bigger picture in terms of organizations in the settlement sector. What are, what are the biggest issues that we face as um, settlement organizations who are helping newcomers to our community settle and integrate successfully? Um, one of the things that, that we deal with is, uh, although the, the newcomers and the, the population that we deal with are the most vulnerable people that uh, you work with and have people who are refugees, people who spent a lot of their time in limbo in other countries and, and went through a lot, but also um, have the resilience of, of uh, seeking and, and going after their, after their dreams and, and willing to be successful and taking challenges and adventures that um, brings um, comes with immigration and, and settlement and resettlement. Um, I wanted to specifically talk about things like um, that are very important. In our sector, our settlement sector, we're very connected in our community. We, we collaborate very well. But what we lack sometimes is the collaboration with other sectors in the community. And we cannot easily do our job of helping newcomers on our own. 
and that that is a, a big big task for us. We we try to reach out, uh, we partner with others in the community, but it is uh, sometimes we need that strategic um, partnership building that is a, a, a task for the whole community, including individuals in the community, other institutions, faith groups, schools, uh, hospitals, and, and all the different sectors. And, and most importantly, the, the uh, economic and employment sector. Um, and not leaving also the, the, the governments, uh, the different levels of governments, that responsibility of uh, as a community to to um, help um, the newcomers, their community, and the immigrants who who we ask for or we bring them here to make sure that they have all the chances that they can have to be successful. Um, also, um, um, alongside with uh, collaboration also is that community engagement. There is a lot that needs to be done in the community to, to help newcomers. Um, even t talking, um, taking examples like uh, we all have programs that happen in the community and we try to bring the settlement and integration services in the community. We, we set up uh, activities in the community, but we also see challenges where the, the um, the, the fear sometimes that is in the community, the fear of the uncertain, the fear of the unknown, and, and the immigrants are mostly associated with that. So people in the community are sometimes afraid the unknown things, and, and it gives us that challenge of doing our work successfully in the community when, when the neighbors are not uh, feeling uh, secure or safe about what we do and about the the people who are new in our community. Um, we, we, we tend to, as human beings, tend to forget that we all um, have the same things to, to care about, have the same needs. Um, and whenever we think about like it, it we always tend to, to change to that survival mode of um, us and them. And that is like what we want to change, but we can't change on our own. We want everybody in the community to, to help with that. Um, going to the specific uh, uh, areas that is listed here that are just part of the challenges that us uh, settlement agencies uh, we face and also our clients, uh, the newcomer, uh, newcomers to our communities. Um, I, I would like this to start with the accommodation, and it was uh, also talked about earlier when, when the mayor was speaking and, and other uh, speakers earlier uh, today. It um, is a big challenge because like, we have people coming as uh, big families, people who come not having um, enough income to also get the kind of housing that they need, the, the quality housing that, as I was mentioned earlier, uh, the safe housing uh, in the community. We have different sections of the community and we want to make sure um, our, our newcomer clients are not alienated or not put in, in a place where uh, no one else wants to live. Um, that is like one thing, but also the other practical things that relate to the number of family members, uh, bigger families, uh, as well as uh, the levels of income. Uh, people who come as, uh, especially refugees, uh, people who come as single, they just may not have enough income to support uh, themselves and get uh, the level of housing that they need to, to meet their needs. Um, also, the um, the ability to communicate properly with landlords and not relying uh, on on service providers like us that has uh, have limited capacity to deal with a lot of the things. We, you cannot be with the newcomers all the time. Although we would like to help, and whenever there are issues, they come to us or they call us. But there, there's the day-to-day -day communication that um, they they have with their landlords and their neighbors, and also understanding their rights and and responsibilities responsibilities. Um, in terms of uh, uh, language, there's another uh, big area and um, we there are services that are available, language training that is funded both by the federal government and, and the provincial government, but there, there are challenges, uh, practical challenges as well as uh, challenges that are, are systematic. Um, the, um, some of the challenges include um, I, um, capacity uh, in terms of uh, our uh, service providers in the community not having enough resources, whether it is space or it is um, uh, meeting the, the requirements of, of the funders. Uh, we always we always hear from government funders and government officials talk about partnerships, but it's always not a, a balanced 
that uh, uh, partnership. It is always, this is how we want you to do the things because we pay the bills, right? So it, it is it is tough when we, we have our own needs and we want to meet the needs of our clients and uh, we are given uh, limited resources uh, that uh, with a lot of demands and a lot of requirements that uh, and instead of focusing more on what is really needed by the client, there's a lot of administrative things that we need to do, uh, even including our teachers uh, have to follow those uh, administrative uh, procedures that are very challenging. And sometimes even the 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 um, the curriculum itself may not meet some of the needs of, of uh, the language needs of, of the of the newcomer clients. Um, there's also the the um, the challenge of uh, prioritizing or balancing what what is important for the newcomers. Is it uh, improving their language or is this, is getting a job? Um, and both of them are important, but making like striking that balance is, is also a challenge. Um, things that relate also to language uh, training is um, job minding. Um, we have uh, clients that have children, young children, and, and we know how job minding is in our community, not only newcomers, but for, for everyone, right? So uh, that puts our, our newcomer clients in, in a more um, difficult position. Um, so it is also um, like language also has um, there's some complications in terms of uh, what the federal government funds and what the provincial government funds and and the different levels of, of language training. Um, the federal government focuses more on the stage one level, like CLB level one to, to five. And um, five and up is, is called normally uh, stage two, and that is where there is some limitation, there's more requirement, there's uh, a different um, eligibility criteria for those. And uh, when people are trying to, it is also connected to employability, right? If someone wants to get a, a better job or want to train better, then the requirement for language is, is higher. And when the, the federal government is only focusing more on that lower level language skills because there's also connected to citizenship, there's also connected to the day-to-day -to -day conversations. But when when you're when people are have um, higher dreams and aspirations and wanted to, to get to different uh, uh, levels of employment, and, and that is also prerequisite. It's a requirement to have a higher language level to, to qualify for those trainings. Um, and that the, also the gap between uh, the lower language levels and the both secondary education. Um, in terms of, of uh, employment, um, there's also the, the discussion earlier today about uh, lack of Canadian experience. How you, how we expect from someone who's new to Canada to have, to have Canadian experience to, to be able to get a job or the job that they, they qualify for. Um, there's also the uh, the challenge of uh, credential recognition for a lot of the immigrants and and, and refugees uh, who who we invite and and come to uh, our communities. Um, also, um, the engagement of employers with with um, tough economic times when we we already is higher competition for everyone to get a better job. If we are trying to help the uh, people who are less advantaged than people who are vulnerable to get jobs, then it is difficult, and that makes also our jobs as settlement uh, service providers very hard. And uh, we try to build relationships and partnerships with uh, employers and, and other stakeholders in the community, but it is, it is difficult and uh, we would like to, to ask all the community partners and members to, to work with us in that area. We can support uh, newcomers while they are at the job, give them the basic trainings that they need. We can equip them with how to apply for jobs, how to build their resumes and put things into paper so that they can be eligible or apply for jobs. But 
we cannot go beyond that. We cannot make them or help them get interviews because if we are facing discrimination and racism relating to people who come from different uh, backgrounds or have different names or uh, uh, and we are sorting to that fear of of the unknown and uncertain and we don't know and, and how the mayor was talking about those uh, s small social networks and, and people hiring, companies hiring people they know and, and those network networks and, and connections. We try to make those, uh, to make up uh, those uh, initial uh, smaller things or important things for, um, for newcomers by creating uh, uh, connections with employers and, and hosting networking events and, and job fairs. But uh, it's always, um, we're, I'm afraid to say that sometimes it's it's kind of like lip service. People trying to 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 come to these events, but not necessarily doing what it needs to to help uh, a newcomer get a, a job that they qualify for. Um, I I wanted to to maybe uh, limit my talk about those uh, areas uh, in terms of challenges, but wanted to also go to other. Um, questions about the uh, how realistic uh, are some expectations for for newcomers and immigrants and refugees there is uh, um, sometimes the expectations are set uh, by the newcomers themselves because they want to succeed and they, they have that higher expectations, they have those uh, dreams that they want to follow, um, but also face a lot of challenges to achieve them. And, and uh, our role is uh, a settlement sector to, to help them um, face those challenges and, and, and succeed. But as I was saying earlier, we can't do that on our own. We want everybody in the community to, to help us, help newcomers uh, achieve their dreams and, and succeed. Um, there are also there's uh, uh, some practical expectations. We, um, all the newcomers, uh, permanent residents especially, are eligible to access uh, services that are funded uh, by the federal government on, uh, as long as they are stay permanent residents. The minute that they become Canadian citizen, then they wouldn't be eligible for those services. We sometimes see priority, prioritization from the federal government of, because there are many uh, permanent residents, they focus more the initial um, time, the first three years. Although that is not uh, a written rule, we always told to help the ones that are, are new. Um, the, the ones that are newer, and after three years, the, some of the services become uh, a little bit restricted, although there is nothing written about them, and in terms of eligibility, anyone who is permanent resident is eligible to all the settlement services that are funded by the federal government. There is some uh, settlement support services that are funded by the province and, and open to all categories of immigrants and, and even uh, Canadian citizens, but they're very limited and there's no enough capacity to support people. That is another area that uh, unrealistic uh, uh, expectation is put on the newcomers. Um, in terms of the uh, the assistance to, to government and uh, private sponsored refugees, there is a lot that can be done. We all know that there are the limited support that uh, people get, uh, especially refugees, both uh, privately sponsored and and government sponsored. There are things that uh, could be done either or there are we we see those things are already happening, but we they could be expanded or extended so that people have better chance of of success. Uh, for example, the income support that the refugees get, uh, even the privately sponsored refugees can get some sort of that assistance so that there is a supplement to what they get from their sponsors. Um, they, there are also uh, a possibility of extending the incentives of, of refugees or, or expanding the government assisted refugees uh, incentive to work. There is a 50% of income that they can earn until their income support is uh, is reduced, uh, that could be increased to give some incentives for refugees to start working earlier if they can and, and uh, support themselves. And that would help them uh, when when that uh, income support is, is, is stopped in, uh, eventually after some time, then they can, uh, they can do better in, in the community and the, in the market. 
Um, there's also uh, a lot of um, the immigration law is another another challenge or another uh, burden for refugees uh, that could be removed. Uh, immigration law could be waived altogether or maybe um, reduced uh, so that the uh, refugees are not dealing with um, paying back a lot of uh, debt uh, in their life. Some of them also may not even know that they have that loan and, and it takes uh, a long time for them to, to pay back, we, especially with uh, families that come with uh, a lot of children. Um, I think um, that that is um, um, the, sir, the um, comments and observations that I wanted to make, and uh, I, I want to, to thank everyone for the opportunity to be able to speak with you today. Thanks, Ali. Uh, uh, given the uh, rather intimidating range uh, that that uh, an agency like Open Door has to uh, uh, cover. I think that was a very uh, useful summary. Uh, we'll turn now to um, uh, uh, Melanie uh, Berg, who is the PATH, that stands for Providing Access to Healthcare Coordinator for Global Gathering Place. Thank you, Alan. So I'm here today to represent Global Gathering Place, which is an agency in Saskatoon that has been providing settlement services for newcomers in Saskatoon for the past 20 years. And I would like to start first by saying thank you for the opportunity to share our experiences in the settlement and integration of immigrants and refugees in our city. So apart from the settlement services that we offer at our organizations, such as language services, drop-in support, programs and mental health counseling, Global Gathering Place also offers specialized services for government-assisted refugees, and that's through our life skills program. And then those government-assisted refugees who have high health needs are referred to our PATH program. As Alan mentioned, that's the program that I work in, and it stands for Providing Access to Healthcare. So I just want to talk briefly about some of the challenges faced by government-assisted refugees on the ground here in our city in Saskatoon, and particularly around accessing health care. I also want to share a few of our successes that we've seen in the city around refugee resettlement. So as we've heard and as we all know, employment and language are some of the major challenges um, for newcomers in our city and particularly for government assisted refugees who have some of the lowest levels of English of all categories of immigrants. However, a newcomer is unable to attend an English class or look for a job if they don't have good health. So it's hard to talk about integration when we have a family who's dealing with critical health condition and dealing in trying to access care. There's not a lot of information in Saskatoon about um, numbers on immigrants and health status of refugees, but our experience in, at least at Global Gathering Place, is that we've seen an increase in the number of refugees who are arriving with with quite serious health conditions. Some of those include physical disabilities, intellectual disabilities, mental health issues, cancer, and other chronic diseases such as diabetes. Now previously, and in the past, refugees with severe health conditions weren't allowed into our country. And that was due to an expectation of excessive demand on our healthcare system and on our social services. However, today refugees are exempt from this excessive demand on health care clause, and they are allowed in, even if they have serious health conditions. One of the UNHCR's settlement categories is medical need. And although it's a small category, there are a certain number of seats that are, are reserved for those who suffer from life-threatening conditions or irreversible loss of function and where no treatment is available in countries of asylum. So this is where I see a bit of a gap between the policy and practice and what's happening on the ground here in Saskatoon. Refugees with high medical needs and very vulnerable situations are being accepted into Canada and into a healthcare system that's not prepared to give them the support they need. Some of the main challenges for refugees in Saskatoon around healthcare are around health coverage and around interpretation. So last night a question came up for the minister around the interim federal health program. 
And that was my question. Um, and I wanted to tell you why that was important for me and for the refugees that I work with and that many of, many of my fellow colleagues work with. Um, the interim federal health program offers basic health care coverage to, to government-assisted refugees, privately-assisted refugees as well, um, also refugee claimants. So the coverage is the ba basic health care coverages. It, it, it covers the gap between the time of arrival and the time that a refugee has, receives their provincial health care card. It also provides supplementary coverage for the duration of one, the first year that a, a refugee is receiving support. However, and so what the, what the minister said yesterday was that he was proud of, of the interim federal health program, um, and especially that, you know, proud that it was reinstated after the cuts that the previous government had made to it. Um, and I agree with him, it's a very good program on paper, but on the ground, it's a different story. Due to lack of knowledge of the interim federal health program by medical providers in our community, um, refugees are left having to wait longer than necessary for health services or don't get them at all. There are some walk-in clinics in our city who are not registered with interim federal health and have turned away refugees who have gone to search in search of urgent care. Currently, we're, we're working at Global Gathering Place with one 14-year-old boy. He has severe medical conditions and although he's only been in Canada about maybe less than six months, he's faced multiple barriers in accessing health services due to problems with interim federal health. First of all was accessing an oxygen machine that he could so to help him breathe easy at night. That took several months for him to get and even though it should have been covered under interim federal health program, he had to wait until his health card came in order to just get that machine. He's also currently waiting for a wheelchair and he has severe mobility issues and that's restricting him from getting around right now while he's waiting for the wheelchair. Again, it's issues with interim federal health that's causing those uh, wait times for him. And lastly, he's also right now dealing with issues around dental treatment, which is a requirement for his upcoming heart surgery. So his heart surgery is on hold right now because of issues with interim federal health and coverage on dental treatment. So this is why this important question I brought up to the minister last night, and I wish I had got a chance to tell him like the reasons why that's a problem in our city. Um, another major barrier in accessing healthcare in Saskatoon is around language and access to interpretation for medical appointments, in pharmacies when getting medications, and in hospitals. And while there have been many gains in the area of interpretation, um, we still have a long ways to go. So, for example, uh, a lot of our clients um, in the PATH program go to the Alvin Buckwell Child Development Centre. It's a centre that provides um, resources and um, specialised services for children with disabilities. Only in the past few years, um, they've been able to offer in-person interpretation for our, our refugee families that access those services. And that was due to advocacy on, on the part of Global Gathering Place um, and getting them to use the services that are actually available through the Saskatchewan Health Authority. Other areas where the, this interpretation service has been used is the Department of Population and Public Health, who we have a partnership with, and they provide immunizations to all refugees using in person, sorry, not in person, but over the phone interpretation services. However, even with this interpretation policy in place in the Saskatchewan Health Authority, our refugee clients face issues and challenges in accessing it on a regular basis. For example, one of our clients recently arrived in Saskatoon and was admitted to hospital for a period of two weeks. And while one of our PATH facilitators visited and helped with interpretation while he was there, the, the hospital never provided interpretation through the phone service for the entire time that the patient was there, even though we requested it and we provided information and handouts on how to use their own service. Um, so it's quite disappointing. In another case, one of our clients went to see a specialist in the hospital, and when I asked if the phone line could please be used, they responded to me, um, no, because it's a waste of my time. So this is kind of some of the issues that we're, our clients are refugees with, with you know, high medical needs they're dealing with in the healthcare system. 
Um, and what's frustrating to me is that these problems aren't difficult to solve. Um, there just seems to be a lack of awareness of, of, of some of the issues, in some cases a lack of willingness within our community to, to take on some of the responsibility. Uh, medical providers just need to register with the interim federal program so that refugees can actually access the coverage that they have. You know, providers just need to try using the phone line. In some cases, it's a bit intimidating maybe to use for the first time, but it means everything for a refugee client, and it also m ensures that they're receiving proper care. So I feel like the community needs to increase their contributions to improving the health care for refugees and immigrants, but there's also other ways that the federal government can help. And the following recommendations have come out of an ongoing study in Ottawa where refugee service providers are experiencing the same challenges. So they're asking for more resources to be devoted to educating healthcare, healthcare providers about interim federal health. Um, and the education also needs to target um, refugee sponsors, service providers and refugees themselves so they can advocate for themselves and understand what coverage they have. Um, another area that can be improved upon is the registration and reimbursement procedures should be more user friendly and timely to encourage health professionals participation in the program. There also needs a way for, to be a way for settlement providers to be able to access um, and communicate with the program in order to answer questions and to solve issues. The health and well-being of refugees and all immigrants in our city will be influenced on the accessibility and the responsiveness of health practitioners in our city and on our healthcare system to their needs. So I mentioned that there have been successes though beyond these, these challenges that we've seen. And that is that our city has an environment that enables strong partnerships, both within settlement agencies and among the community. So there's four settlement agencies in Saskatoon that provide services um, to newcomers and have each developed a unique and complementary array of services for, for all categories of immigrants. Um, for example, Global Gathering Place works in partnership with Open Door Society to provide services for government-assisted refugees. And another example of successful partnerships in our city has been the Refugee Health Collaborative. The Refugee Health Collaborative is made up of a group of people who represent um, the University of Saskatchewan. They represent Department of Population Public Health um, through the Saskatchewan Health Authority, as well as Department of Mental Health and Addictions. We've got a lot of physicians interested in refugee health and pediatricians. Um, the Saskatoon Community Clinic. And that collaborative has, has really been able to develop a new um, REACH refugee clinic in Saskatoon. So thanks to all of the contributions of each one of those members of the collaborative, we've been able to open a clinic in Saskatoon without any additional funding, but with all of our partners contributing whatever they can in whatever way. They've all refused to stand by and accept the fact that we just don't have funding for this, so we won't do it. But they've all contributed and made it happen, and the refugee clinic has now been uh, providing services to all refugees in Saskatoon for over one year. So that's definitely a success story, and it's a, it's a unique model that can be shared with other communities. So to, final, to, to finish off here, I feel like there is room to welcome more refugees in our city of Saskatoon and more immigrants. And uh, as we heard, our, our country and our communities actually need that to thrive. But we need to have more support from all levels of government and from the community because it's not only the responsibility of the settlement agencies to help integrate newcomers and to invest in our common future, but it's all of us. Thank you. Thanks, uh, Melanie. Um, you know, I uh, have always known that GGP took its uh, health care uh, very seriously, but one day, one afternoon, I uh, walked in there to, uh, to volunteer and I was immediately whisked into a back room where I was accosted by two men armed with hypodermic needles. So uh, apparently, un unknown to me, uh, that was uh, when uh, free flu shots were being given. <laughs> 
Okay. Uh, thanks very much, Melanie. Uh, uh, next on the agenda is uh, Helen Smith uh, McIntyre. She chairs uh, both the Saskatoon Refugee Coalition and the Saskatoon branch of Amnesty International Canada and uh, currently works as a trainer with the Refugee Sponsorship Training Program. Thank you, Alan. Is this working? Yes. Okay, thank you. So, greetings to all. Shlam alochen, assalamu alaikum. Um, it's a pleasure to be here and to have an opportunity to hear all the different perspectives on immigration and refugee work. As I begin, because I'm a fifth generation Canadian, it is important always for me to acknowledge that this is Treaty 6 territory and this is the, the homeland of the Métis Nation. I grew up in Prince Edward Island. I grew up on the land of the Mi'kmaq people and that land served us our food and our place to live and our daily work and continues to. My life has taken a, a bit of a change. Uh, just over a year ago, I, after 35 years of being a volunteer with Amnesty International and with the Saskatoon Refugee Coalition and with private sponsorship of refugees, I became employed in the sector. So, as Alan said, I'm now a trainer with the Refugee Sponsorship Training Program. And that program started in 1998 as a means of providing support for sponsorship agreement holders. It's grown since 1998 from one trainer uh, based in Toronto to now having not only several trainers in Toronto, but trainers across the country, and I'm one of them. It's a program which is funded by Immigration Refugee Citizenship Canada, and uh, the expectation is that we will will train people. For me, it's in the province of Saskatchewan to do all the different kinds of refugee sponsorship. And not only to do the sponsorship in terms of the paperwork at the outset, but also to support sponsors in the settlement process throughout the year or more that they might be responsible for the refugees. Now, knowing that I had several other speakers ahead of me, I uh, took a look at the title and decided to carve out a niche for myself. So the niche I've, car I've carved out is what are some of the settlement and integration challenges faced by privately sponsored refugees and by the refugee sponsors. Now, privately sponsored refugees, you've heard some numbers referred to, but uh, just to repeat, in 2018, out of the 330,000 uh, landings that will happen across all the sectors of immigration, there uh, will be 18,000 privately sponsored refugees who will be landed during this year, who will arrive in Canada during this year. And 7,500 government-assisted refugees, plus now the 1,000 vulnerable women uh, who will also come as government-assisted refugees. So we're, I'm looking at 18,000 people when I speak for this year. And it's a fairly small piece of that 330,000 uh, pie. In the event that some people might be new to the private sponsorship of refugees, I will just say there are the three ways in which private sponsors are involved in sponsorship. Uh, that's through sponsorship agreement holders, uh, organizations, mostly churches and ethnic groups, who have an agreement with the government to do sponsorship. And then groups of five, which is a gathering of five permanent residents or citizens who live in the community who want to sponsor uh, some refugees, or community sponsors, which is again um, an organization, but an organization that doesn't necessarily 
have an agreement with the government. The last two, the groups of five and the community sponsors are, are sort of an ad hoc arrangement, whereas the sponsorship agreement holders are a, a continuous kind of arrangement where people continue to have agreements with the government. So it uh, was mentioned by the minister uh, last night that uh, one of our, our current and best exports is our private sponsorship of refugees program in that other countries are looking seriously at the program as it's evolved here in Canada since 1978 and uh, are wanting to, to model our program because we are unique. We're the only country in the world where civil society can be involved in sponsoring refugees. The role that the private sponsors play is the same role that RAP workers or resettlement assistance workers uh, have in the settlement agencies. So we do all of that greeting at the airport, finding the home for people to live in, furnishing the home, the household effects, the food, uh, introduction to schools, to banks, to buses. All of this is the work of private sponsors. And for uh, the bulk of private sponsorship, the money comes from the sponsors. So either the group of five has raised the funds or the church or the community group has raised the funds to support a refugee or a refugee family for a year. Now, I want to talk about one of the challenges that's not been mentioned, and the challenge is uh, about family reunification. When refugees come to Canada, whether they're government assisted or whether they're privately sponsored, they come carrying a heavy load of guilt and concern about those who've been left behind. And uh, all of these folks are in a similar situation of desperation because if the people who've arrived are considered to be refugees, then very likely the people who've been left behind are also refugees. And those who are left behind are, are often pressuring the people who are here. Now, you're in Canada. You need to find a way to get us to Canada. And I see people nodding their heads. This is a, a very common experience for people involved with refugees. Um, and... You know, the message is, bring us to Canada. Like, you're living now where the streets are paved with gold, and here we are. Uh, the bombs are falling around us, and we have nothing to eat, and we have to escape, and we're sleeping on a church floor, or we're in a refugee camp, and we don't have any money, and we can't work, or somebody's being arrested because they violated the law in the country where they are. So our families who come... Uh, often have sleepless nights and many trauma triggers because of the need to be surrounded by, or at least to know that their other family members are safe. And all of this takes time, and many of our private sponsors are involved in family reunification um, because it's important to integration. As long as refugee families are on the edge and anxious and, and, and stressed, then it's very difficult for them to really settle down and begin to make a life in Canada. This is so important sometimes that it even feeds secondary migration. I've seen families uh, leave here and go to Windsor, not because they have family in Windsor, but because they have family in Detroit. And they feel closer, so they're able to visit back and forth. And there's another aspect to family reunification or being united with family, and that's the, the aspect of families who've always lived together as extended families. And it's the... the uh, Toto and Jiddo, the grandmother and the grandfather, who do the child rearing and who take care of the children 
and the younger generation are the, the people who support the family. And so I often hear people say, so when, when my mother and father come here, then uh, my wife can go to work and you know, we can support ourselves better. But in the meantime, families are struggling. And just as an aside, one of the reasons why I think the Saskatchewan Immigrant Nominee Program was so bogged down uh, in the early years was because it became a family reunification program. And well, I know that, that that's how people saw the opportunity to bring their sisters or their brothers or their cousins or whatever. Now, the, the situation of family reunification has become particularly poignant uh, with the Syrian uh, refugees. Uh, we've, we've done this before. We've brought a large number of Kosovars. We've brought the Karen people from a protracted refugee situation. Um, and in this era, we've brought the Syrians. And in every one of those eras, there's been what we call as private sponsors the echo effect. And that echo effect is about family reunification because the government is not going to bring the adult daughters or sons. The government is not going to bring the parents. The government is not going to bring the sisters or brothers. So uh, it, it falls to the private sponsors uh, to pick up that piece. And also just to note that, as Bill mentioned, there was a spike in the numbers of government-assisted refugees in 2015, 2016. That spike was the Syrians, because in the end, between 25,000 dedicated government-assisted refugees and followers, some of whom were blended visa office referred and privately sponsored, we brought in about 41,000 Syrian refugees in 2015, 2016 into the country. Now, how do, like, facing this need for families to be together and looking at the situation of the, the Syrians, it's, uh, these are the people that I see most frequently in my job because the sponsorship agreement holders have been limited since 2012. So each year, each sponsorship agreement holder is given a certain number. So to create the context for that, because it's been referred to several times, um, in 2012, the government decided that uh, as private sponsors, we were bringing too many people. And some of those people, the government felt weren't really refugees, and some of those people, um, there was too much emphasis on family reunification in the private sponsor program. So sponsorship agreement holders, who've been around since 1978 and nine, were limited in the numbers of people that they could bring each year. And uh, for this year, 2018, uh, sponsorship agreement holders have been limited to um, 8,500 people. Last year it was 7,500. The reason for the limitation is so that the federal government can clear the backlog. There is some, last year there was still some 40,000 cases of privately sponsored refugees in process in embassies and visa offices around the world. So the government decided that these cases needed to be processed. So hence the large numbers of arrivals of privately sponsored refugees. And the energies of the visa office staff have been put into, into processing privately sponsored refugees and hence the decreased number of government assisted refugees. So here we are as a private uh, sponsorship of refugee community with these limited numbers 
and all the Syrian people who want to bring their families. And not only Syrians, but we have Eritreans and we have many other populations who, who need sponsors, private sponsors. And then, uh, in addition, for groups of five and community sponsors, uh, the expectation is that they, will, they can only sponsor people who have a refugee status determination document, which to use the Syrians again as the, the example, which they cannot obtain because the United Nations High Commissioner for Refugees that produces these documents is not doing refugee status determination in all the countries that are surrounding Syria. In other words, the UNHCR is overwhelmed by just registration and providing shelter and trying to ensure the safety of the large numbers of refugees in Lebanon, Jordan, and Turkey. So when we talk about family reunification and we look at where we are now with large populations of people really wanting to have family around them so they can truly settle and integrate into our society, like we're faced with a dilemma. So the uh, shahadat la Jew has become a very common phrase in, in my refugee document, refugee status document, refugee certificate, a, a common phrase in my conversations with the people from Syria because they, they know kafala, they know kanisa, so kafala is sponsorship, kanisa is church, and so they know that <laughs> church, <laughs> they know that there are problems with church sponsorships because of the allocations. And they know that about two weeks ago, the churches did get their allocations for 2018. And uh, they know they can't get kafil for kafal homosia, and that they don't have shahadat laju. So they can't find sponsors to help them do group of five, and they can't do a group of five unless they have a refugee certificate. So step by step, they're understanding how difficult this is. And I've, I've been approaching it two ways. I use the Iraqi community that I'm very familiar with because I've, I've done sponsorships with the Iraqi community in Saskatoon since 2001, and I've known them since the mid-'80s. They came, when they came, there was one or two families and five single guys. And they're a community now between two and 3,000. And almost all of those people came as privately sponsored refugees. So I also know the word shwaya shwaya, little by little and step by step. <laughs> your, your families will come but they will, it will take time, and we will find a way. So that's the, the main point that I want to make that I thought wouldn't overlap with my colleagues. There are many more challenges, um, but I guess my, my message to the community is, please, if you are at all in favor of doing private sponsorship of refugees, mm -hmm. there's a big opportunity. <clears throat> Okay, thanks very much uh, uh, for that, Helen. Um, uh, April Sora is the uh, Immigration, Diversity, and Inclusion Consultant for the City of Saskatoon. She's had uh, long experience working and volunteering in the uh, immigration and refugee sector, both in Toronto and Saskatoon, and working for the federal government as a senior development officer, uh, human uh, resources advisor, and employment equity consultant. And she's also uh, active, as a matter of fact, in the Saskatoon Refugee Coalition. April. Thank you so much, Alan. Um, <clears throat> I'd also like to 
first acknowledge that we are here on Treaty 6 territory and homeland of the Métis people. Um, I do take that very seriously and to heart. Um, the work that we do at the City of Saskatoon, I, I try to explain to people that really I don't work in immigration so much as I work in community development. And I think um, that's really critical to the work that we do. And I think Joe was um, had emphasized that too, that it is, it is about relationships. It's about building relationships and um, keeping relationships and, and connecting those in, in the community. So um, I I've had a great opportunity with the City of Saskatoon to also be working with the First Nations and Métis communities. Um, and hopefully, I, you know, I, I do hope that part of what I do in the, as I go into the future is to sort of build those bridges um, and make those connections, as I think everyone is doing here and working very hard towards that. Um, I'd like to thank all of the organizers and uh, for inviting us here today. We had two representations from the city of Saskatoon, the mayor, and the mayor took some of the things I was going to say. So, <laughs> However, I will work on some other things. Um, and being here um, so connected with so many people in the, in the audience, but as well as the speakers here, um, I feel like I'm with family. So um, no judgment and uh, all forgiveness. Um, so it's a little bit, I find it a little bit easier actually to, to present to a room like this. Um, uh, I wanted to sort of start with just a little bit of context. So something that, um, same, same as Joe, um, I had a PowerPoint, um, but I, I, that's fine. I, the only reason I really need a PowerPoint is to keep me on track, because otherwise I go way off. Um, so um, like Joe, I had a PowerPoint, but unlike Joe, my first slide was of Joe. So <laughs> I actually had a picture of Joe, and I was so excited to be able to show that. Um, anyway, so... <laughs> so um, I just and, and that was all sort of just to set the context of what we do at the city of Saskatoon and um, how we came to where we are now and of course um, and again you know the mayor already explained to you the connection between Joe and myself so uh, Joe and Ken Ponticus many years ago did do the original research on um, on uh, the city of Sas the community of Saskatoon, and um, what was going on at that time. So this was probably in sort of around 2005, 2006. And um, you know what was going on in Saskatoon. We the, the community develop and race relations um, committee uh, put the question forward, and um, so the city commissioned or worked with Joe and Ken. Ken Ponticus, and um, they helped to come up with um, uh, recommendations. And one of the recommendations was to create a full-time position, and that position was to help to uh, work in the community and develop an immigration action plan, and to bring the community together to do that. And so, of course, they did that, and out of that came the immigration action plan and this position, um, which at that time was a tripartite agreement between the federal government, the provincial government, and the city of Saskatoon. And so, um, uh, following following that um, came the um, uh, a report card even five years later and then uh, after that um, of course the recommendation to one of the main recommendations then became um, you know that we needed a much more coordinated effort around immigration and issues of immigration and integration for the community of Saskatoon. And that's where the local immigration partnership came in. Um, I, and I'm gonna, I think I'll circle back to that a little bit later. I don't, I don't have a lot, a lot to say. I, I mostly wanted to um, talk about um, sort of the big picture of what, of what the city is working on. And, and when I thought about this presentation, I thought about, um, we usually use the term, and this comes, I, I believe, from IRCC, Immigrations, Refugees, and Citizens Canada, is you know creating welcoming communities. They've been using that phrase for a long, long time. Um, when I sat down to think about what I wanted to share today, I thought, you know, what is a welcoming community? And what does that mean to us at the city of Saskatoon? It's, it's an incredibly broad term. And it, it's very, it feels nice and it sounds nice, but what really is it? And so, um, you know, being sure enough, you look and there's research and there's actually a definition of a welcoming community. And there's 17 characteristics even of a welcoming community um, by Victoria Essays. 
and um, she did some research. And um, so there, there are things such as, of course, employment opportunities, fostering social capital, um, affordable and suitable housing. And the one that, of course, I connected with was number seven of the 17, uh, municipal features and services that are sensitive to the presence and needs of newcomers. So I think that's probably where um, a municipality does sort of fit in. Um, and so breaking that down, I then tried to figure out, well, okay, so then what does that mean? And how, does the, how do we reflect that in the work that we do? Um, so I came up with um, two things that I think are most important, and I believe were already mentioned today, and I was just so happy that they were, because I, I think it connects, and I think it means that we're sort of thinking along the same lines. And I came up with two words, which was empathy and equity, and that we're all, that we're working towards an equ empathetic and equitable community. And I do believe in all the work that we do, that is ultimately what we're working towards. And so what does, what are the, what are those, um, what are the qualities then of an empathetic and equitable community? community um, and I can and this is not research this is just me this is just out of my head and and what I what I think w in doing my work is um, the five things that I think for um, an empathetic and equitable community are uh, first of all seeing ourselves reflected in the community um, secondly having a voice and being heard uh, thirdly, is knowing and understanding the systems so that you can become part of them and be able to use and access those systems. Uh, knowing and understanding our history so that you know what came before us. And also um, building, helping always to build community capacity that we're all working towards that, which means that we have a common goal. So, um, I, just, so I just wanted to sort of reflect very quickly on, on those points. And the first one being we see ourselves reflected in the community. And I, I think so many people have already talked about that in many different ways. I just wanted to give um, a, a very quick example of, and I had some really good pictures here too, but um, of, 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 of sort of my experience in that and, and why I think that's so important. Um, it, I grew up in the 60s and 70s in, in suburban Toronto. And uh, at that time, as you can imagine, and I still think even now, um, in media, media played a big role in my life, television and music and all of that. Um, there were very, very few um, Asian or people that looked like me in media or television or pop singers or whatever. Very few, if any. The only one that there was was Adrienne Clarkson. And she was a reporter on CBC, and she did all kinds of... And the reason, though, I, I think that I related so much to her, too, was she wasn't portrayed in, you know, as a geisha. She wasn't portrayed in a kimono with a white face, and which at that time, most Asians would have been portrayed like that. And even, they were probably white people acting as Asians. So... Um, uh, Seeing Adrian Clarkson was just so, um, it's something that has stayed with me my whole life. The importance of having that one person on top. And she had like a bouffant hairdo and she had these really cool mini dresses and, and she'd wear go-go boots. And she just was so cool and funky and, you know, she was sort of like, like me, right? Like, <laughs> except I was not that cool and funky, but you know, it's what you want to be, right? It's not like I didn't want to be a geisha. Nothing wrong with geishas, but that's not who I wanted to be. So anyways, I think um, seeing ourselves reflected in our community is just something that I think is so fundamental to have a sense of belonging. And of course, working at the city of Saskatoon, it's, it's really what we strive to do is to ensure that all residents feel a sense of belonging to the community. And I think it's one of the hardest things for um, newcomers or people that are new to Saskatoon, especially those coming from overseas, um, is to feel a sense of belonging. You're just trying to live, you're just trying to survive. But you know, we want, we do hope that there's more than that. We do hope that you know you can become part, like as the mayor said, you know, become part of those systems where you can sit down and talk to the person beside you at a soccer game and have those really, you know, hey, how's your kid doing? And those really just sort of casual conversations and get to know each other. So um, that's sort of uh, the, f the first one, is just seeing ourselves reflected in the community. Um, having a voice and being heard, I think, um, uh, Something that, that happened last week, actually, 
and actually many of you were here and some of you were presenting at it, um, was Journey of a Refugee. Um, um, and I had such a, a, a wonderful experience. Um, it's, a, it's a subcommittee that we worked with from the uh, Saskatoon Refugee Coalition. And um, I, I think those types of events, um, if we make spaces for people, we need to make spaces for people to be able to um, be able to speak, tell their stories, those that are ready to, and um, also to listen and to hear those stories, and then to let those stories inform the work that we do. And there's nothing stronger for me than hearing those stories, and I do hear them, and I have so many mentors and friends in the community that help me to learn those stories. Um, as you know, I mean, I was born in Canada. I was educated in Canada. I always tell people that, you know, I'm the easy check mark. Um, I act like them. I walk like them. I talk like them, but I have the look, right? I look Asian. I have the color. And so I've always had that going for me in a lot of ways, just though in the last, say, 10 to 20 years. Before that, it always worked against me, right? Um, but now it always works for me. So, you know, people feel really comfortable because I don't speak with an accent and I don't, I don't have, yeah, like, weird foods at home and things so you know uh, people can relate to that and so I'm it's easy to hire me it's easy to you know I'm not dismissing the work that I have done in the past but I'm just saying in terms of you know who we are and having a voice um, I'm much more it's much easier for me to have a voice. It's much easier for me to find spaces like this to have a voice. I don't think, I mean, I know of many people who have a lived refugee experience, and I don't know if ever in their lifetime they will ever be able to get up in front of a group of people and tell their story. And so, you know, we really depend on those that can tell their story to tell it. And let's make the space for those people to tell those stories so that they can be heard. I think it's the only way in terms of empathy and equity, I think, you know, it keep going back to that. How can we have empathy if we don't understand, if we don't know where people come from? And I think those are the best ways of doing that. Um, Another, another piece is knowing and understanding systems. And I think, again, this has been addressed. Um, I won't reiterate too much. Um, but really, I've, I've experienced working very closely with a refugee community this past year or two years, and I just see how excluded they are from our systems and how, many, how far we have to go from the city of Saskatoon to really truly be making changes in that and making our systems accessible. Whether it's, um, uh, whether it's registering for programs, how do you even know what programs exist if you can't read the leisure guide or if you can't access the leisure guide? You know, so knowing the programs exist is being able to register for them. Can you register in person anymore? I don't know. Can you online? I, I don't know. So, like, what exists there? You know, so many things are not accessible. Um, and so I think at the city of Saskatoon, in terms of challenges, we really need to work on things like that. And we are, you know, it's, it's, it's very hard to change systems. That's all I can say. Having worked for first for the federal government and now with the municipal government, it's hard to change systems, but it's not impossible. And so the, uh, that's something I think we need to work on. Um, and we already talked about the local immigration partnership. If anybody has any questions about the local immigration partnership, please call me. Everybody here almost has my phone number. So please call me if you have any questions at all about the local immigration partnership. And if you think you should be involved and in what way, please, by all means. Um, do I have two more minutes? Do I have one minute? Um, I just... Uh, Okay, I, he says I just had one minute, but I don't think I took up that much. Did I take up that much time? Okay, okay. Anyways, I just wanted to... Just, so I'm going to just change the, the, the feeling of it a little bit. Um, because I... Two things I've never done before. One is um, uh, I've never read off of my phone before in a, at a conference or speaking, but I'm going to try. Um, and I just wanted, I really wanted to share something for you because I think too that the city of Saskatoon as well as other, um, organi other systems, uh, other services really need to work with settlement org organizations too because I think within settlement organizations themselves, I think we need also need to acknowledge you know, there are challenges within settlement organizations too, right? Like whether it's money or um, programming, whatever it is, all the things that Ali was talking about, you know, we need to acknowledge that. And also that 
a high percentage of people working in settlement agencies are you yourselves refugees and immigrants? And so again, you know, another whole layer of, of complexity. Um, so I'm often asked to, to speak to the, uh, to, to the welcome or orientation for new, new students uh, that come to the university. And so um, last time I wrote this little poem about something, and it was based on an experience I had coming to Saskatoon, walking through the streets. I didn't know anybody in Saskatoon when I moved here. And um, I just remember walking downtown and feeling invisible, and just feeling nobody saw me because nobody knew me, so nobody recognized me. And I just, I, I, that feeling just was so humbling to me. Um, and it also made me think, of just how, how hard it must be for newcomers, for immigrants and refugees when you come to a new country, how invisible you might feel at times and how long it takes to, f to feel visible. So I just, I'm, just humor me, I'm just gonna read this poem to you. So it's called You Are Not Invisible. I look and I see you, sitting, staring, Tired of twisting your tongue around awkward English words. Tired of listening to strange voices. Longing to hear the laughter of family and friends, of familiar songs in familiar language. I look across the street and I see you, feeling burdened with the heaviness of winter clothing, boots, parka, gloves, scarf. Tears come when you feel the cold bite your fingers, toes, ears, face. Yearning to walk barefoot outside, feel the softness of cotton and warm winds touching your skin. Oh, to taste the sweetness of fruit picked from the tree. I look across the aisle and I see you, walking tentatively, eyeing the colorful shelves of cans and packages, stopping, touching the unknown fruit, intrigued by its sweet scent. A boy on tippy toes trying to reach the top shelf of candy heaven, you reach out to help and to connect. I look into the window and I see you, now smiling. New friends, like family, together in your home. Rapid talk, no inhibitions, no fear. Cooking familiar dishes for unfamiliar palates. Dancing with abandon to music unknown, unheard, now loved. I look over the vast prairie and I see you merging and moving in unison with the world, slowing for others to catch up, to touch their hand and welcome them, singing with abandon to songs in many tongues, no longer alone, no longer invisible. I look and see you and you are there in your loneliness and your joy. Well, that was really uh, uh, beautiful, April. Um, uh, I don't think you have to worry anymore. Everybody uh, knows you now. <laughs> uh, okay. Um, what's the? Uh, well, we're we're right on the mark, actually, for the um, uh, for our break, and we do have another session coming up. What's what's the uh, call here? Uh, Dan? Uh, well, maybe we can take a couple of brief and to the point uh, questions or, or feedback if you have of, of any uh, of these panelists. Uh, Thanks, yeah. Alan. Good decision, or bad one, maybe. Uh, <laughs> um, just very quickly, uh, if I may, I, I just like to um, tie all that all of you said with what the minister said last night. And uh, it's really about the question of the relationship between policy development, and policy implementation. If you remember last night, the minister talked about a lot of initiatives that, have, that the, his government has been undertaking. And when you think about it, it's really about uh, not dreaming up new frameworks, new policy frameworks, but how to do better with the policy frameworks that are in place, it's the implementation. And this reminded me, and I'll come right back and make the point, but it reminded me of a question I asked when I was much younger to a deputy minister, a famous deputy minister, and I, he, they, that was the start of the new public management you know, paradigm, and he was going to do everything, focus on management, and I stood up and sheepishly asked, uh, but Minister, Mr. Minister, what about 
uh, Deputy Minister, what about uh, what about implement, what about uh, policy development? And he said, he said, young man, I was young once, <laughs> young man. <laughs> he said, we're up to our yin yang in policy. What we got to figure out is how to implement it. And I say that because we have to be mindful of what we're asking for, and that is, and what, what's being asked of us by governments, and that is they're not asking for new big policy frameworks because it's like a bit of a, like a strategic plan. We have a strategic plan. The question is, how are we gonna develop the action plan and make sure that we, we can implement it effectively? So I'll stop there. Um, April's poem just about took my voice away. I wasn't sure I was able, gonna be able to to stand up and say that. But I think that's important. And all of you, in your own way, said that you're actually working on, and the challenge is implementation. So thank you very much. I'll, I'll take that as more of a, a, a comment than, uh, than a question. But thank you for, for the show, please. Okay, well, unfortunately, we have quite an action-packed uh, schedule, so uh, uh, if you'd like to take a, a break, I'm getting kind of saddle sore myself, uh, these, these seats. Anyway, uh, and uh, at uh, quarter two, we'll uh, reconvene for the final session. Thank you. Thank you.